When William Shakespeare wrote What's in a Name in Romeo and Juliet, he was really demonstrating that a name only becomes important with the connotation and context in which we place it. So that which we call a rose would smell as sweet by any other name. I've always been slightly bemused about this place name. Now I know I'm being naughty, but is it the Big Church of the Twit or is it the Church of the Big Twit? This particular anglicization of one of our beautiful Welsh place names, I think it's something of a shame because of course it doesn't bear witness to the significance and importance of this place, San Istidvaur, this vitally important early centre of learning and religion in Wales. So it's particularly appropriate that I should be here at the church dedicated to St. Elfdid. Just a few days after his feast day, but I want to know a little bit more about this revered saint. And I know a man, Archdeacon Philip Morris, who is able to tell me much more about St. Elfdid. So Philip, before I read your book, I have to confess I knew very, very little about St. Elsted. So I'm anxious to know a little bit more about who was the man, you know, mm. what was it like at that period and what did he achieve? Yeah, it, it's difficult to sort of nail down St. Elsted. He's a very enigmatic uh, character. Um, what we can say for certain was that uh, he was um, a priest, he was a teacher, that he established a monastic school here in Llan Echtidvaer, in Llan Twit Major. Uh, that school subsequently flourished, but as far as St. Echtid himself is concerned, we know very little. Um, what we can say a lot about is his achievement in that uh, uh, the school was uh, reputedly had up to 2,000 pupils, that uh, uh, reputedly uh, people like St David, the patron saint of Wales, was taught here, uh, St Samson, who became one of the founding bishops of uh, Brittany, St Gildas, quite significant people in the history of, of Wales and Brittany. But as far as St Echtid himself is concerned, hmm, not quite sure. <laughs> but it's interesting, isn't it, how his name has just reverberated down the centuries. Absolutely, and that shows the, the importance of this particular place and uh, the tradition of St Echtid that uh, uh, has been held for, well, 1,500 years, if, if not more. It, it is absolutely remarkable. You know, when you visit a place like Tintin, Tintin Abbey, mm -hmm. I walk around there and I get a good understanding of what mm. a monastic settlement mm. looked like. But of course, that was how many hundred years after uh, St. Edmund? Yes, exactly. So do we have any kind of idea of what his settlement and his centre of education yes. might have looked like? Yes, we have to use clues. Um, most of the uh, descriptions of Flanachtid of were written about 800 years of after it did, so we can't go by historical documents. What we can go by is examples elsewhere, and particularly from Ireland. Um, St. Sampson, uh, or at least the biography of St. Sampson, which was written about 50 or 60 years after St. Echtid, is the earliest record that we have. And uh, Samps, uh, the description there um, of the school would show us the extent and, and so on. Of it, uh, that it was a school which had um, children, families, um, 
trained people as missionaries, as, as, as priests, um, that uh, uh, bishops would come to ordain people here. So it was quite a significant um, place. That's fascinating. So you had this combination of the religious order, but you also had the secular side. Absolutely, yes, well. yes. Uh, because the records of kings sending their children to be educated here. So, uh, yes, it, it, it was and the curriculum, as uh, the biography of St. Ethel of St. Sampson says, the curriculum included uh, philosophy, geometry, rhetoric, uh, reading, writing, arithmetic, um, as well as biblical studies. And now, perhaps you can put one argument at rest. I was reading somewhere that this is reputed to have been the first university centre of learning in Britain? Well, that's what the Guinness Book of Records say, and who can dispute that? <laughs> yes, we were here before Oxford or Cambridge or <laughs> any of the uh, venerable institutions of today. <laughs> well, isn't it remarkable that such a place like Lantwit has such a phenomenal history? Oh, absolutely. Thank you yeah. so much for introducing it to us. <laughs> Pleasure. Pleasure. The restoration of the west end of the church was actually given the Welsh Architecture Award by the Royal Institute of British Architects. And the first few lines from the citation sums it up perfectly. It says, The Galilee Chapel is the realisation of a dream to restore a ruin which had remained in disrepair for over 400 years and provide a suitable building to commemorate the cradle of Celtic Christianity in Britain. Of course, we can't come to this neck of the woods and not mention Yolo Morganog, which is the bardic name of Edward Williams, who was a local stonemason who lived here between 1747 and 1826. Now, he was a character in every sense of the word, and besides creating the Goddess of the Bards, he was also an antiquarian and had been speaking to a local shoemaker, Richard Punter, who was evidently a knowledgeable and intelligent man. And that shoemaker had said that somewhere in the graveyard you would find buried a stone commemorating two kings. Well, Yolo duly excavated the stone. It's here in the collection behind us now today. And first of all, he placed it in the church porch and then continued excavating. And lo and behold, what did he find but the skeleton of a 17-year-old lad who was seven foot, seven inches tall and then became known as Will the Giant. really great that there's a place for the 21st century in this wonderful ancient church because that's what churches are all about change and use over hundreds and hundreds of years you know there's so much history in this magnificent church that obviously we can't cover it all but there are a few items that have caught my eye for example, this really magnificent, beautifully carved Norman font. And just down the nave is another bit of carving, which I think is very, very special indeed. Going around the church, I've been reliant upon the excellent guidebook to point out the very important historic features including this one. This is the carving of Jesse below this modern cross. So it's a lovely combination between ancient and modern. I need my glasses for this because the guidebook has all the information. They describe it as a very rare treasure of the church. A 13th century carved stone representation of the ancestry of Christ. At the base is Jesse, the father of David, asleep. Out of his side there grows a tree 
the branches of which extend on two sides, bearing the heads of the kings of Judah, of the house of David, rising to the head of our Lord at the top. And if we jump a few centuries forward, I just love this memorial to Mrs. Jane Says, who died in 1747, aged 29 years. And what I find particularly charming is that her memorial is topped by those two lovely little angelic spirits. Of course, the Victorians and the Edwardians, well, they really couldn't leave anything alone. And this church was one of many that were restored, refurbished by them towards the end of the 19th and in the early years of the 20th century. But amazingly, this place also experienced an event during the Second World War. Because this building, the priest's chantry house, was destroyed by a stray bomb dropped from a German plane thought to be returning from a raid on the oil tanks in Pembroke Dock. So I'm really interested to know a little bit more about the past and present of this church. And who better to ask than the present incumbent, Father Edwin Council. Edwin, thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here in this wonderful church. And kind of you to let us in. Absolute pleasure. Richard, welcome. Edwin, whenever I come into a church, I try to make a point of going to look at the, the board, which yeah. lists all the incumbents, and ask myself questions about them. You know, we, we know about some of them, we don't yeah. know about others. But I'm interested in, to, in knowing what did they actually bring to the church? What is it that really excited about the church. Mm. So I ask you that question, what is it that excites you about this church? I suppose one of the things is just being a name on that list, because it's an awful long list. <laughs> when you think, you, you know, if you could trace it back, you probably can't, but to trace it right back to, to Ishtid. Um, and to almost to have that, that legacy, um, and to have that just, just placed in your hand, not, not, not to have and to hold, but to just to have for a moment before it's passed on to somebody else. It's a, it's a, it's a rare old privilege, that, in, in a place like this. But I suppose I look around the building and I, I see it in its completeness, but, but I also see how it different parts of the building function in quite different ways. So the features of the church, I suppose, become really important. And my starting point wouldn't be altars or pulpits or anything like that. It'd be, it'd be a simple thing. It would be the door. Shall we go and have a look? Let's go and have a look. Well, okay, Edwin, but so, what's so special about this door? It's just a door into a church after all. It's a door, isn't it? The thing is, for me, unless people come across this threshold, they're going to experience nothing of the fabulous wonder of this church or, or know anything of its fellowship or its work or its witness. So for me, the door, I mean, it's a lovely door to look at, but gosh, that can be a barrier to people. And one of the things that we've started to talk about here is, is about radical hospitality. What does it mean when that, that door doesn't become a barrier, it becomes a gateway? And ironically, we're here, this is the oldest bit of the church, this is what we call the West Church, the original parish church, it goes back to the 11th century. And, and I can say to people, you're coming into the modern bit. <laughs> it's the, the oldest bit of, of what we've got here. But that's been the threshold for people to come in here on their, their greatest days, their, their most tragic days. Um, people coming in with the, the burdens of life or, or whatever it might be. Um, and I suppose what we're trying to do here is to say if that door becomes a gateway, a threshold, and we're saying to anybody who comes here, you know, you, you are welcome, not despite whatever's going on in your life or whatever you're burdened by, but, but actually you're welcome because um, th then you have a first step into a, uh, an understanding of what radical hospitality means. Um, and that's, that's the touchstone for, for the, the life, the work, the witness of this place today. So, yeah, it's the oldest feature of the building that we've got. Um, but 
it's crucial. If, if people come this far, and I bet loads of people have got as far as the door of lots of churches, turned on their heel and run away because they think, oh, I'm not worthy or I'm not wearing the right clothes or, oh, I shouldn't be here. Um, if we can stop it being a barrier and, and, and make it a threshold, then, then that is God's work today. Okay, Edwin, we've seen the door. Where next? <laughs> well, I've shown you the oldest bit of, of this, the modern part of the church, but do you know what, Richard? I've got something even older to show you now. Okay, lead on, sir. Come on. Aha. You know, Edwin, the first time I came in here, my immediate reaction was, wow. You wouldn't be the first. <laughs> uh, it's, it's astonishing, isn't it? Yeah. I, I always say to people, there are plenty worse places to come to work in the morning. Uh, and I, and I've, I've been here, what, six years, and, and I still have exactly the same feeling about this, this space. Because um, it's, it's remarkable. I mean, the, the chapel itself is, has probably went into disrepair, decay after the Reformation, probably built 14th century, something like that. So it's, it's not notable in any particular way. But, but what's happened, um, and it goes back, it links actually to a great character of Welsh history, Yola Morganog who spent a lot of time in this area and researched and discovered, uh, so tradition tells us, a lot of these stones around the site of Llanistid. So bearing in mind it's bigger than the churchyard, I think the, the big stone behind you there, the, uh, the, the Samson pillar, I think that actually been used, uh, the story was it was used as a gravestone to lay over the top of a, a very large fella um, who'd, been, uh, who'd been laid to rest locally. Um, but these are important because, uh, you know, we talked about the door as the, the gateway, the threshold, and that's the, the oldest feature of the existing church. These bear witness to a tradition that goes right back to the time of Ishtid, back to the, you know, the early years of the 6th century. Um, and we don't have much from that time, and the, these don't go back that far. Um, but to me, they bear witness to the tradition of Ishtid. I mean, this, this is the Ishtid pillar on, on the back. They've even, and hardly anybody goes around the back of a Celtic cross, they look at the front. But if you go around the back, they've carved his name in Latin. They've carved Ishtid on there. Probably, you know, two or three hundred years after his death. What was the impact the guy had? You know, this, this, this astonishing character who was still, still a couple of centuries later, that they will bear witness to Ishtid. But the, the, the one that I really want to talk about, and the feature of it is, is this, it's called the, the Huot Cross. Um, it, was, it was carved, it was carefully, prayerfully prepared for a man called Howell. But it, in so many ways, it sums up everything of our work today. How so? Well, I suppose there are two ways of doing a church like this. You can, you can fumble around in the dark and in the, in the dust, trying to find fragments of the past. Or you can say, well, th this is what the legacy we've been left. And, and we try to bear witness to the tradition that comes with them. And, and for me, I mean, you know, there's everything in the cross, you know, it's the arms of Jesus Christ open, it's an embrace of love to the world, but it's that, that intersection of God and humanity, that is our lives. It's the work of this church. It's surrounded that circle. I know it's got a bit bashed here and there, but when it was new, when it was <laughs> a few dings and scratches along the way, absolutely. But, but that, that's representative, that is the love of God. That, that sense in which you take all of our creeds and our doctrines, everything about Christian faith, you know, not too bizarre an analogy, but boil it down. What's the sticky bit left in the bottom when the whole thing is reduced? It, it's, it's the love of God given without, without strings attached. It's just given completely. And if that's surrounding everything, but the, I suppose the thing I, I, I most respond to is the not work in between. And to think that, that this is probably what, 9th, 10th century. You know, the guy who made this, probably a fella, got up in the morning, had his Weetabix, kissed his wife goodbye, went off to work and started, started doing this. And I, I think to myself, I, I wonder if he took special care over the knot work here. Because that's the, it's the crappiness of life. You know, it's the pandemic and it's, it's the mother-in-law and it's work and family and your football team. And it's all that stuff of life going on. And yet it's still the intersection of God and humanity, the, the, the completeness of God's love surrounding it. That, that, that ties for me into the, the radical hospitality and the welcome of this place and everything of our work. 
It's so interesting. What I find fascinating about your description here is that we tend to look at these things and we almost look at them in abstract and forget mm. that they were real, breathing, happy, sad, thin, fat, whatever, you know, people <laughs> who were actually yeah. involved in doing it. And that's such a beautiful summing up of the human condition. Yeah. Yeah. I also think to myself, the fella who was making this, where did he make his mistakes? <laughs> Where was he tapping away? He just, found it. Oh, <laughs> <bugger."> <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the best he could do and it would have had his, his great skill, but also the completeness of his imperfection in it as well. And, and once we, we see ourselves in that, then we see ourselves as God sees us and, and, and then God can do something with us. Sure. So Edwin, when I came in this morning, I had something of a surprise because I walked into the door and there were men and women in leotards in the church. What was going on? Well, you ought to be thankful nobody turned up in a mankini, for goodness sake. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness sake. We have a yoga class here on, uh, on, on well, this morning, that was it, it takes place every week, uh, which has been great. Um, it's chair yoga. Uh, and we say to people, you know, come along, chairs are provided. Um, but it's, it's been great. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it, for me, it fits in with some of the spiritual reflection that goes on here as well. Um, and, and it's good fellowship. Um, because this part of the church, the, the West Church, the oldest part, um, we, we don't worship in this part. It's, it's that, back to that sense of this being a place of welcome. Uh, and so we have all sorts of activities that go on. And, and for me, um, it allows the sacred space, the main church and the Galilee Chapel down there, it allows those sacred spaces to speak for themselves. There's, there's almost an invitation, it draws you into the sacred space, whereas this part is where we do, do, do lots, of, lots of other things. So what other things take place here? Well, I mean, we've, we've done a lot of work around, around music and art. Um, really? I'll, I'll show you a, a few of those. I mean, the, um, the, 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 the music events we have, uh, we have everything from um, obviously small concerts and things like that. Uh, we had a Calypso band in a few a couple of weeks ago as part of a conference we were running. But once a month we run an open mic night here. An uh, open mic night? Here. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> tremendous. Um, and, and, you know, it's brought people back to music. So um, what kind of music? It's not well, all the spiritual church music, is oh, this? Oh, no, we have enough of that. I mean, I'm an old punk from the 1970s, so, so I, I... And I'm a, I'm a terrible musician, but I, I've, I've kind of got the... Um, she always had a testicular fortitude to stand up there and play a few songs. And, um, and, and people say, well, if that idiot can do it, then, then I'll have a go as well. And, it, and it's been joyous. There's a serious side as well, though, because um, in 2019, we've been running this for about 18 months or so. And, and one of our performers, um, Belle, said, oh, I'd love to, love to record some songs here. She's an you know, accomplished musician. Um, and she recorded um, an album of songs in the Galilee Chapel largely around the theme of, of mental wellness. And we, we had this, this, this CD that was pressed, and we thought, well, what should we do with it? Let's, let's do a launch. And we launched it on World Mental Health Day in October 2019, um, with a week's worth of activities for local young people. We did workshops on well-being, just, just picked up mental health and wellness as a, as a, a really strong theme. Emerging from that, you can see a, a, a pop-up here for Samaritans. We are in a formal partnership with Samaritans, so um, they come down here to use their training materials, uh, and we speak a lot. I mean, we, we oh, I wouldn't say we're, we're not a hot spot or anything like that, but I, I think we've become a community that's brave enough to talk about mental health and, and take some of the stigma away. Um, but I mean, the other partnership we've got, there's another display just behind you, Richard, over there, to do connected with women's aid. Um, and, you know, just the, the, the fundraising, we might do a collection or a you know, pass the light around the, the open mic and, and, and send that off to the local branch of Women's Aid, those sorts of things. You know, the, the, the focus of domestic violence gets, gets hidden away so very, very often. Um, and it's not that having these displays here changes things, um, but people know that they can find information and those little cards you can just slip into somebody's hand. You know, just that moment when you're worried about somebody who's just not quite themselves for whatever reason. Um, and I suppose we, we've ended up just using this as a, a, just a flexible space um, where, where welcome is here. Um, we worship on a Friday lunchtime uh, in the church and then we have a soup lunch on here afterwards. So whenever we worship, we try and have some fellowship with it as well. 
Um, it's we just happen to have at the moment the, the, the tail end of a, an art exhibition that was um, painted by families from within the Ukrainian community who oh. are, uh, are, are living in the Vale of the Morgan. Um, and we, you know, we had contributions towards art materials and, and, and a couple of artists within that community. Um, and it's been absolutely fabulous. And so many people have said, you know, here we are nine months into that awful war in Ukraine. And, and so many people have said, how can people in such an awful situation just paint things that are so joyful? Um, they really are. It's remarkable the resilience of the oh, human spirit. Oh, it really, it is. really is in the middle of all the sadness. But I'm looking forward to the open mic night because I'm a great Elvis fan. So how is Elvis <laughs> and Punk going to work together? Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's only one, only one way to find out, Richard. I mean, the stage has been great. Look, it's, it's, we've talked about... A, 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 a wonderful 11th century archway, an uh, 8th, 9th and 10th century carved Celtic crosses and a plywood stage. <laughs> Absolutely um, brilliant. But, but in so many ways that, that sense of, of community and of gathering together, of welcome. Um, and you know what, I, 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 if it hadn't been for the music I grew up with, I wouldn't say I wouldn't be doing the job I'm doing, I wouldn't be doing my job the way I'm doing it. Oh, come on, you've got and to explain this. No, it is. I mean, I grew up listening to punk, which is, which is about, about kicking back against what you're told to do and what you're told to believe. And, and, and in so many ways, that, that shapes my ministry. I'm not here to tell people to go to church, for God's sake. But I'm here to, 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 to speak about things that are, that are profoundly of God's love, that, that transform people's lives. And, and sometimes that is about kicking over some of the things that are... That are, that, are, that are given and respectable and, and expected. Um, because unless you break free of those things sometimes, you, you never actually find the, the, the opportunities of, of, of love and transformation. So, so that stage, um, if it becomes a gathering point for people in, in, in fellowship and in community, um, we allow people to flourish. And when we allow people to flourish, there's a little bit of space for God to work as well. So I play a long game on these things. And, and if we get 60 or 70 or 80 people in here for an open mic night, and I can't wait to hear your, your Elvis. <laughs> That's a deal. <laughs> um, but, uh, but no, it's, it's, a, it's a parable of a, of a, a lot of the things that we do here. Um, and, and in all sorts of ways, um, whether it's the architecture or the history um, or, or what we do now, it, it makes my heart rejoice. And I hope it makes God's heart rejoice as well. Well, I've had a superb day. I've had the benefit of looking through this amazing church and around parts of this wonderfully historic town with the help of these terrific books and leaflets that have been written by the Lantwit Major History Society. And I've also had the pleasure and benefit of the knowledge and experience of two marvellous men. Archdeacon Philip Morris, who has researched and written so brilliantly about the life of St. Elfted, and Canon Edwin Council, who has made and is making this church vibrate and live in both the past and the modern senses. What a lucky man am I. Get ready now, go, get, go, but don't Step on my blue switch, 